Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the last day of this uh, e-promo course. I uh, would like to, to thank everybody for, for the, the commitment, uh, for the, the attention you, you paid uh, in every lecture day. Now, today is your turn of uh, presenting, is your turn of being really active in, uh, in this course, uh, for, for you have to show all, all the, the, the presentation of the, of the working groups. But first of all, I would like to, to welcome and give floor to Rosalara Romeo from FAO Mountain Partnership uh, for a, a short closing remark. Please, Rosalara. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, well, to close this course, but you know, it, it would have been much better to be together with you in person, but let's hope that uh, now in the coming years, this will be possible. And we really all look forward to uh, hear your presentations and also to listen to your comments. This is the second time this course is run virtually and we are all learning how to improve our way to deliver our presentation and our interaction through the system. But um, of course, we, we really uh, value your feedback. So if you have any comment, any suggestion for us, please feel free to share with me or with, with Danilo, with Michele, uh, either now during the, the space for questions or uh, later on by email. Um, as you may know, we had uh, about 40 people registered for this course and about 33 of you uh, really took part in this course. And um, as I was saying at the beginning, this is a way to um, ensure that you are part of the Mountain Partnership Network. The Mountain Partnership, as you may remember from my presentation on day one, is the only United Nations partnership that is devoted to promote sustainable mountain development. So uh, we really encourage you to engage in the Mountain Partnership uh, to uh, use the hashtag Mountains Matter for your uh, social media interactions. Um, in the coming days, I will share with you all uh, an Excel uh, file uh, where all the participants are organized um, according to their countries. So basically, all the participants in the 14th EPROM edition will be listed there and will be organized country by country. This will allow you to get in contact with other participants from your own country or from countries where you have an interest. Uh, we know, of course, that some of these emails are no longer valid, so bear with me, be patient, but, in, but some of them are, no, hopefully most of them are still active. And uh, so you can have an idea of the people that have taken part in this course since 2008. And I'm telling this to you because we think it's important to create capacity at national level within countries to create a core group of committed people that can work together, that can rely on each other wherever there is a need. Uh, so feel free to contact the other participants uh, from previous years and uh, to establish a network. In some countries, uh, the mountain partnership has a presence because those governments are members of the, still, of the mountain partnership. In other countries, the national authorities are not part of the mountain partnership, but you can find uh, sometimes other institutions. Altogether, I think we have uh, 60 governments in the mountain partnership, but a presence in about 98 countries. So most of the countries in the world, uh, well, half, I would say, are, are covered. But feel free to get back to me uh, anytime in case you have any question or doubt. Um, so, uh, you, as I was saying before, you are now part of the Promo family, of the Mountain Partnership family. Um, mountains need your support. Mountain needs your uh, help. You have listened a lot about this during this, uh, these two weeks. Now, there is a lot to do in mountains and there is a lot to do to raise awareness about the fact that mountains need more investment, more political attention, um, more priority in national policies. So please, uh, we, we count on you. We hope that you can all stay engaged. And uh, as Mountain Partnership Secretariat, we are there to really support you in your effort. Um, so count on us. So without further ado, over to Danilo and back to you for uh, the presentation. Many thanks.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa Laura. And okay, now it's your your turn. So uh, I would like to uh, to thank everybody because every group sent their presentation at the right time, first of all. Uh, now I would like to give floor to group number one, and I would like to know who is the the, the participant who will present the um, who will show the slide. Sorry. So I, I give him the or her the. Um, Hello, Danilo. I'll share my screen. Okay. okay. So we I will give, we I will do you. a joint presentation, but I'm the one sharing the screen. Okay. I give you I give you the the power as a speaker, <laughs> so you can share the screen. Okay, great. I invite all, all the all the participants of group one to, if possible, to open the, the camera. And if you are ready, I I give you the floor and welcome to this closing ceremony, group one, please. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Go Slide ahead, number please. one. Yes. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you so much for reaching this this final day and giving us the opportunity to present. Uh, this is the, it was it was a, a, an interesting debate that we had in in our group, uh, and uh, I think this is important. I think this should be slide number one. Uh, we as a group we present each one of us presents a series of projects that we are in, involved in our own countries. Uh, it created a, a very interesting debate, but at the end, keeping in mind uh, the objectives of this iPromo summer course, some of the classes we had during this week and the projects that we presented, we have this, this uh, group agreement that the project regarding beekeeping as an alternative livelihood from Uganda that was presented by Godfrey includes most of the, the objectives established within the iPromo school and can be presented as a result of the work by the working group. So we'll start with Godfrey presenting this project. Godfrey, please. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yes, so this uh, beekeeping uh, project, uh, which is an alternative uh, livelihood project, uh, in Mount Renzori in Uganda, which is uh, found in the western part of the country. Uh, it is a beekeeping project uh, that came out uh, as a result of the effects of climate change uh, in the region, but maybe one key thing to highlight is that this project is found uh, in a mountain, and that is one of the reasons uh, we selected it. Uh, so the project is being implemented in Kasese district in Renzori Mountains uh, by an organization called uh, Remoda, which is Renzori uh, Mountains Development Association, which started in 2015. Uh, so this project, uh, because of the uh, floods that affect the region and the drought, uh, uh, the drought that affects uh, the, the farms and, agri and, and agriculture in the region, uh, these women had to come up uh, with uh, groups, community groups, and start beekeeping as, as an alternative source of livelihood uh, because their farms and their businesses, uh, most of those in agriculture, were being affected by climate change and they were not producing so much. So they came up with uh, this project and it has been supported by Remoda, uh, which is a community-based organization. And now they have uh, over 425 beehives at present. And the women in Kasesi are happy uh, in this project. And uh, even amidst COVID-19, as we shall see in the subsequent slides, uh, they are trying to move uh, with this project. Yeah, maybe next slide. Can you still see the screen? Yes, we can yes, see. Yes, yes, very well. Okay, so Miris, up to you. Is Miris with us in the room? You're on mute, Miris. So I'm sorry. So this is Karalabas from Cyprus, Mount Institute. Sorry for the delay. 
Uh, so let's see why working group one has selected this uh, subject. Uh, first of all, uh, the main reason it, it is because it focuses on the women of mountain community. We thought that this was a, a quite relevant issue with the concept and the purpose of the iPromo seminar of its stu uh, structure as well. Um, moreover, it's a project directly affected by the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, the case that is, uh, as Godfrey explained to us, is uh, directly affected by the uh, pandemic. Uh, also, it is linked with the important role of insects pollination in particular, uh, pollination and bees in particular. And last but not least, is directly linked with the climate change, uh, one of the hot topics that we saw and notice of the IPROM course. Thank you Thanks, very much. Miris. Thank you. Back to you again, Godfrey Gr Nut. Yes, so uh, as you can see uh, on the left, we have the map of Uganda, of course, which is located in the East Africa. So uh, someone maybe who knows Lake Albert, that's uh, just near Lake Albert, uh, uh, on that side of the Western uh, region, between Lake Albert and Lake George. I'm sorry, they are not mentioned here, but that's where the Mount Renzori are in the border with the De Democratic Republic of Congo, but that's where the Mount Renzori are. Uh, we have put a picture of the mountain there. And as you can see, another picture is uh, this, this group of women and uh, the support team that they had, they were dressed in, in that protective uh, gear to protect them from uh, the bees and they took that nice photo. Yeah, so really uh, it is an interesting, uh, picture and really highlighting how the project uh, goes on in the region. So yes, Ryan, was the objectives of the project? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So uh, these are the uh, two, uh, two main uh, objectives, which is the uh, to improve the community livelihoods by providing uh, an alternative sources of income. And the uh, second one is the, the create resilience to climate change, uh, change in the uh, community. Next, please, Joel. For the benefits, uh, we have the here the, the, uh, to improve the livelihood, livelihood uh, of the community women groups uh, by being a, a big group of number of women and uh, uh, of this area and uh, that will encourage uh, other women to participate. Uh, another uh, benefit is the women have a stable alternative source of income, and that means the women would have uh, a lot of uh, uh, behaves during the year to help uh, them last and help. Also, uh, some uh, women uh, reinvest some of the income for honey, uh, selling in their uh, farms, uh, like help them uh, to have um, you know, like uh, other uh, sources of income uh, from the farms, such as like, even if it's vegetables, fruits, or whatever. Uh, and here, uh, the benefits um, uh, of the households can uh, also consume honey uh, cheaply since they uh, produce it uh, themselves, by themselves. Also working as a group uh, gives them a higher uh, bragging power and promote social uh, cohesion. And uh, it can lead uh, in time to creation of its own uh, brand, under which is uh, uh, which to sell its uh, honey. Yeah, yeah. Again, uh, these are some of the images uh, for this project uh, that is existing and. As you can see, uh, there is a picture where they were in one of the offices, uh, really during some of their meetings. And another one, they were seated outside uh, in a place near the Renzoi Mountain, seated under the trees, and they were having some engagements, uh, especially for their groups and discussing how to take uh, their projects forward. I'm sorry, I was on mute. I was saying that although the objectives and the benefits of this project are now clear and you can see why we, we, we select this project, it, it was clear for us when learning more about this project and discussing the project that there were some challenges and the challenges were directly related with COVID-19, but they are also 
not related with COVID-19. And we thought that uh, although COVID-19 is, a, is, a, is a, a terrible situation right now, we thought that it was important to highlight other other challenges that were not linked with that, but were linked with other topics that we cover. So, for example, they were affected by the floods in this in this region. And another challenge with inadequate resources to expand the projects. So those two were identified as non-related with 19, but of course related with COVID-19. No physical meetings, and we just saw that that picture that Godfrey explained us the importance of the meetings. No physical meetings was was uh, happening because of because of COVID-19, and directly linked with their commercial activity, there is a, a, a reduced market activity due to the travel restriction, uh, restrictions between districts in, in Uganda because of COVID-19. So, some immediate solutions, and these ones uh, were, were directly linked with COVID-19. For example, what happened is that these producers, they start selling locally. Instead of going to to regional markets, they start selling in the local markets that were still available. Although these restrictions to travel between districts were were present, they can still travel to local markets. And something that happened, and this is really important as well, they were they were they managed to keep in contact, not in person, but they managed to keep in, in contact and support each other using using uh, phone calls. So these were some of the challenges. These were some of the immediate solutions, and I think it's important now for us to tell you what we discussed as a group about how to move forward after COVID-19 or during this recovering period of, of COVID-19. So we came here with, with three uh, main areas. And I would like to use this opportunity to say that we are supposed to, Tala was supposed to be with us in this presentation, but she, she excused herself. She said that she couldn't be present due to a, 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 an appointment with a with doctor, but she sent us her, her thoughts as well. So, if you agree, I will cover the first one, promote formal ways of organization, such as a, a cooperative. This is something that we mentioned, and the importance of these uh, women, these uh, beekeepers, to organize themselves in a cooperative. This will allow them to expand to other markets. This will allow eventually to, to expand to e-marketing, and we are completely aware that some of these women may not have what is called this digital literacy, but if they are organized in a cooperative and if someone can be in charge of this uh, e-marketing part, can be a good way to, to, to sell the products. Of course, being organized in a, in a, in a collective organization such as a cooperative, it will allow them to, to, to promote advocacy on behalf of the beekeepers, and that uh, links with areas such as, for example, insurance or the awareness and promotion of small farm products. And another aspect that we, we somehow mentioned here about the, the brand, that means that they can organize themselves, have their own brands, or, for example, participate in other promotional events such as fairs. Godfrey, second point to you. Oh, yes. Uh... Like, like, yeah, like we previously mentioned, really the COVID-19 affected them, uh, like the picture showed they used to have meetings before, but as of now, because the country is under lockdown and we have measures and guidelines to stop the spread of the COVID-19, no more meetings, no physical uh, gatherings, um, the solution, uh, one of the solution, uh, Rodriguez has already mentioned it, uh, for that, we suggested that uh, if they formalize and come up with a cooperative, it will be great. Yes. Then another one is on promotion of the of their products to the tourism sector. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, Uganda attracts many tourists, and this this region of Mount Renzori specifically also attracts many tourists, uh, the local tourists, but also uh, others coming from outside, and Uganda is still open to tourists, though the movements are, are not are restricted, but tourists are allowed to move. So we suggested that if they can sell to hotels and also tourists in the hotels, it would be important for them uh, to widen their market as they cannot move from a district to another, but also uh, if if they was if they take an, an advantage of 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 ex, um, utilizing the work in the tourism sector, they can promote their business and their livelihood uh, would be improved. And then um, combining also tourism with beekeeping, uh, people can 
can go to visit uh, their field and see the work they are doing, the great work they are doing, and they will still get uh, more money when people visit them in the field and when they combine this beekeeping itself with tourism uh, alone, they will uh, improve uh, their projects. Yes, then someone else can uh, take us in the last and the solution on uh, the third one. Uh, that, that was Talas part and I have her notes here with me. If that is okay. Please. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. So if you remember, we said that the challenges were linked to COVID-19 and I think these two two uh, initial topics are linked with that, but we also said that some of the challenges were linked with climate change, and that is not directly at least COVID-19 cover. So uh, one of the solutions for those non-COVID-19 related problems, we thought that they need to find solutions to prevent and mitigate this negative impact on of climate change. So we thought that uh, uh, if floods is a problem, if storms is a problem affecting the, the, the beekeeping, we thought that uh, early warning system that can be either linked to their mobile phones or even national, local radio, national TV, usually in these countries, the radio works really well, can be uh, can be a good system. So the, 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 the local agriculture extension office should try to find a way to communicate uh, changes in the climate to these to these uh, beekeepers in a, at an early stage so they can animals and also technical support linked with agri-environmental schemes, the use of cropping the diversification and uh, wildflower strips and all these type of things that may help to increase the production of uh, the bees and the honey. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Group 1. Uh, and, uh... Congratulations because you you used all the so 15 minutes and nothing more. So <laughs> perfectly organized. And I'm sorry that because you have some uh, issue concerning the connection, but uh, this is uh, how we have to, to to live today. And the connection is is uh, one of the problem of this kind of online schools. Um, so uh, we have five minutes for questions or comments from other uh, participants. And uh, so please, if somebody is interested in some detail of the other of the project presented, now is the time to ask. <laughs> Michele, please, I have a question if it's possible. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thanks a lot for the nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. But uh, I have a question for maybe I missed a point. What is the uh, order of magnitude of the production of honey? I mean, it's a large production because you say also a production available for curious, not only for local consumers, if I understood well. And so if this amount is increasing in the last years, it's something that is satisfied this potential, no? Uh, interest also for curious for a large market. So thanks a lot for this clarification. Maybe I missed this point, sorry, but just an order of money amount of production. Do you do you have numbers of the production per hive in kilos or whatever from your from your region? Just an order of magnitude. You have an idea of it. Oh, a market. I'm sorry, I didn't get you so well on, on, on your question, but I think is it about the numbers in in the, how much they produce? And the magnitude of this of this uh, local market, right? How many? If you can tell us how many women are involved in the project, if you have the idea of the amount of uh, beehives that they have, the, the the annual production, 
uh, that will give uh, that will give Michelle uh, an idea of the magnitude of this of this project. All right. So, uh, like we said in the presentation, the number of beehives they are four hundred and twenty five. And the number of uh, of women, so they are organized in in groups, and each uh, these groups are in different sub counties. But of course, in the end, they are in they are in one bigger group. Uh, so each group has about ten women, and in in total, they are they are they are about they are about twenty groups. Uh, so that gives you, if you are to multiply 20, because they range from 8 to 10 in per group. So I can't get the exact number, but if you have to make an estimate, 8 to 10, and there are 20 groups, so you'll find that uh, you are close to having 200 uh, women in, the, in this group. And the market, it is really now, like we said, because of the COVID situation, uh, they are they don't move from a district to another they sell to the local market and there is a town called Kasese town so the market is really not so big but uh, because they can't travel from their district to another because of the restrictions now they have to stick to that and as you saw in our recommendations or oh, the solutions we are presenting is that if they formed if they formalized because these are really informal groups if they formalize and uh, form a cooperative, they would sell outside their own district even in during these times of COVID-19. I don't know if, if that answers your question. Yeah, perfect, thanks a lot. Great. Okay, okay, thank you very much. And thank you, thank you, Michele, for your question. There is another from Piyush, yes? So I just, uh, well, very interesting uh, work. I wanted to share some similar work from India, which might give some insights. So we have a tiger reserve called the Sundarban Tiger Reserve. It's a very well-known tiger reserve in the mangroves uh, of the Gangetic Basin. And um, there you had local population that used to go into the tiger reserve to harvest honey at very high risk of life and also illegally. So the forest department actually set up a program where they gave them bee boxes. So it's no more the people who are going into the forest, it's the bees who are doing the journey and coming back. And this product is actually marketed and branded as honey from this forest. So it's it's got a very good uh, association. And this story uh, of how it's actually safer for the people and of greater interest to the forest is also part of it. And what they've been able to do is that they've set up a bottling plant locally and they're using e-commerce, including Amazon and other platforms to actually sell across the country. So, for example, I live, I don't know, 1,500 kilometers on the other side of the country and I can order online and I receive the honey at home. So that seems to have really helped them uh, tied to uh, the COVID. Thank you. Uh, excellent work. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is the last question from Panab. Then we have to move to the next uh, group, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Danilo. First of all, congratulations, Group 1, for this wonderful presentation. Honey happens to be one of my favorite uh, Elements, I mean, it's not just because of its taste. Otherwise, also, I'm a, I, I can, I call myself a honey affectionate. Uh, because of the collections that I do, I, any given point of time, I would always have six, seven varieties of honey at my place that's collected from different parts of the country. Uh, uh, I was part of a very interesting program earlier uh, in the Himachal Pradesh, which is uh, again in the Indian Himalayan region of in, uh, uh, state in India in India. <clears throat> uh, so where we realized that, you know, uh, to be able to support uh, and also uh, after seeing uh, the dropping of uh, natural ecosystem services for pertaining to pollination, we started working with uh, apple farmers promoting honey induced pollination. And thereby we ended up actually supporting bee flora and beekeeping in the region. We have trained about 300, 
uh, or uh, farmers uh, to be able to support uh, pollination per se. We were not looking at the commercial uh, uh, angle to the whole thing, uh, but it turned out to be a very successful project. It also, uh, there has been uh, constant uh, reports of uh, natural pollination getting increased in that area because earlier what happens uh, due to the drop uh, in the natural bee population, particularly Indian honeybee, which is Epis sirana, we have a significant po population of Epis uh, mellifera, which is European bee, but uh, the, uh, the local honeybee population drops significantly and people there, especially these commercial uh, farmers, they're like apple farmers, they used to hire honeybee boxes per season. And the cost is about in a thousand rupee uh, Indian rupee per boxes per season. That is the cost they pay as a rent. Uh, so to replace that and also to induce uh, natural uh, pollination, uh, we've started uh, growing uh, beekeeping in that area. So yeah, I really liked your presentation and I could uh, it, it resonated with my experience with honey. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, okay, uh, I'm, there is uh, another question, a short, a short one, uh, Gurjan. Uh, really short, please, because we have uh, uh, three more presentation to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, I have a very short question. I was wondering how do the beekeepers deal with the insecticides or herbicides or whatever they put in the agriculture uh, that may cause the dead toes of, of bees. That's not a short question, Guzan. That's, that's what, <laughs> no, I'm joking, but that's one of the, uh, I can tell you what is happening here, you know, but all, all the beekeepers are struggling with that, you know, especially because when you deal with animals, if you are a shepherd, you may try to drive your animals to areas that are not contaminated. But if you are a beekeeper, you cannot control the area where your insects fly. And that's one of the key issues about, that's why selection of the areas is so important. And to be fair, in a mountain area, higher you are from the, the lowlands where, may they, where they may use more of these products, maybe you will increase the quality uh, of this of this honey, uh, I'm, you know it's it's very difficult to answer this question, but it's 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 all based on it's all based on creating awareness to don't use that, so you can you can save the pollinators and selection of the good places. I'm a beekeeper myself, so I suffer with that a lot, uh, trying to choose the best places, and then you see mortality in your beehives due to the cross contamination with. With other with other areas of agriculture, such as the crop production and things like that, it's very difficult. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Group 1. Uh, thank you to all the, for all the questions. Now it's time for group 2 and uh, I have already. Provided Pranab with the privileges as a, uh, as a speaker and. You should be able to share the screen, hopefully. Okay. Okay, okay, great. So I invite uh, uh, participants from group two to open their camera and to, to start their presentation. Okay, welcome. <laughs> so group two, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. So I, on behalf of uh, Group Two, uh, thanks all the organizers and and the co-participants for giving us this opportunity to share our thoughts on post-COVID uh, uh, planning something to do with post-COVID recovery. Uh, so a group uh, had a very intensive brainstorming session, a series of sessions, I would say, and that we have come up with uh, the idea of having using one XP, uh, project as, as a case study to our, our presentation and which uh, has been largely contributed by uh, about nine members from our team. And some of them, of course, couldn't uh, be part of the deliberation for, for, for whatever reasons. But, uh, uh, 
so uh, and uh, the group thought you know maybe i can make the presentation on everybody's behalf so thank you once again uh, for uh, for uh, to to all our uh, team members so basically we are going to talk about a very interesting uh, subject of uh, post covid recovery in the mountain in the context of local mountain development rather uh, so we decided to uh, use a project site uh, in uh, the Uttarakhand state of uh, India, uh, which is again in the Indian Himalayan region. It's a very small village. It's called Viti, and that also happened to be one of our project sites. Something we have been working for last uh, close to three years now. And so Liti is a very interesting area because it uh, happens to be part of the fragile ecosystem in the Himalayas and. Uh, uh, it's, it's it's a very small settlement, you know, right? Uh, it's, it's, you know, secluded away from the hustle bustle and not widely visited. Despite being a very important uh, location, it kind of, we, we, we call it a, a getaway to Namik Glacier, which is a very important glacier, which is uh, somewhere uh, uh, not very far, far off from this village. Uh, so this village has a very small population of about uh, just about 2000 people. Uh, but the interesting part is this, uh, uh, this small village represents every other element of challenge that we face in a typical mountain region in the Indian Himalaya. And uh, we want to talk about uh, using this site as a, we want to talk about, you know, how uh, in a post COVID scenario, how things can be put together, especially solutions can be put together to come up with a recovery plan. And uh, uh, so this uh, has uh, has been, you know, uh, witness, sorry, witnessing uh, wide ranging challenges to do with changing climate, to do with uh, uh, outward migration, to do with uh lack of livelihood opportunities to do with uh, lack of basic amenities like education and healthcare but this has become more pertinent where uh, once this was like everybody else the entire world uh, uh, this part was also stuck by covid-19 and now suddenly the moment was restricted it was more like a uh, uh, it, it was a sudden blow i mean people didn't know what to do with it we were all you know uh, kind of uh, uh, helpless. Uh, the primarily also because the population here was uh, they, they basically they're into sustenance farming because you know they have small very small uh, land holdings and primarily they grow for their own consumption and usage like things like rice, potato, garlic, cucumber, and few very few dairy products like you know, clarified butter or buttermilk. Uh, though gradually they are trying to also get into cash, uh, cash crops like kiwi but uh, things have become very difficult as as soon as the, it was stuck by the covid 19 although we saw a little trend of reverse migration because you know the, the people who were outside the village they came back mostly came back during the covid 19 but a lot of people didn't have anything to do they didn't have a job they didn't have any other livelihood source didn't have any savings uh, or, or, or any other income to survive on so things becoming very difficult and uh, uh, due to the devoid of a basic medical facility that that was another story altogether people were really finding it difficult to go for you know appropriate treatments uh so as we were exploring and brainstorming uh uh, on the issue of this particular village in the Uttarakhand of India, we came across issues like very common uh, issues like uh, climate change is already there. I mean, it's, we, we have had uh, reports of a lot of erratic behavior in terms of temperature, rainfall pattern, snowfall pattern. There's also uh, new diseases are being reported from, uh, from the agriculture, like, you know, potato, uh, there are changing pattern in flowering, the very uh, significant uh, of, 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 uh, angiosperm called uh, rhododendron, which is a, a signature plant uh, of this particular region. So, uh, and then uh, this uh, slowly, gradually, people are also witnessing things like uh, water crisis. Uh, 
agriculture has been distort, uh, disturbed. So, and there's a persistent uh, risk of uh, disaster like situation because of the change in climate, uh, climatic and weather pattern. So, uh, keeping all that in mind, we were trying to come up with certain uh, solutions. You know, of course, uh, when we are talking about solutions, we were trying to be very holistic. Uh, however, all all the issues cannot be addressed in one go and uh, in one uh, one sort of we needed a combination of many solutions, combination of many uh, interventions. So uh, we've realized that you know uh, instead of looking for solutions elsewhere, it it would be more appropriate and wiser to look inward, look for solutions in and around instead of going out for solutions, going out for intervention from outside world. You know, it, it, is, it, it was making more sense to be able to build the local resilience, to, to be able to build uh, or, or look for solutions locally with locally available resources, and most importantly, based on nature. So uh, we, we identified a set of you know, potential solutions uh, in a more futuristic perspective. Like for example, although currently there's, there's no direct disaster risk uh, to it, but there are there's a potential for having disaster in the future. So we wanted to focus on proactive and reactive mechanism of disaster preparedness. We also wanted to based on the experience and the learnings that we have had uh, during this uh, last more than a week during this course, we also wanted to look at uh, uh, mod, uh, concepts like integrated watershed management or, or, or to be able to empower these local people through training and capacity development and oh, sorry, capacity enhancement or skill development. And also things like because the soils play a, a very important role in the mountain uh, landscape. And we also wanted to incorporate things like soil ecosystem services and factors affecting soil carbon sequestration. But And similarly, uh, there were issues like, which is again, again, from a futuristic perspective, you know, forest fire, human wildlife conflict, although it's not directly evident, our people are not facing any conflict at this moment. But, you know, the way things are changing, the way uh, landscape is changing because of the changing weather pattern and, and changing climate. So there's a uh, there's a possibility of facing these challenges in a, in the near future. So we we were looking at to also understand the landscape better, understand the ecosystem better and we propose to use uh, a citizen science based approach to monitor various you know with, uh, environmental parameters and, uh, and 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 on the basis of that prepare and come up with more resilient solutions more resilient and participatory nature based solutions community based uh, livelihood models like tourism homestays and also create access to better access to uh, alternative uh, technology solutions uh, primarily for heating, co uh, cooking, and drying of vegetable uh, producers because you know these areas they are essentially dependent on these three uh, elements, and and uh, to be able to provide uh, more uh, environment friendly, low carbon solutions that would make more sense. And and by doing so, we would also want to focus around building capacity and skilling these local people so that they're they're entirely on their own. They're they're self dependent. They don't need, need to rely from uh, for our external support while they implement these kind of projects. And uh, apart from that, that we also want to uh, look at and, and propose things like a resilient food system by combining agroforestry practices, diversification of crops family farming, precise farming system, so on and so forth. And, and, and also, because since these are, um, you know, small land holding farmers, they needed a lot of held holding and to be able to diversify their, their product, to be able to enhance their production, and then thereby create a model to access market and, and, and create market linkages. And for that, we propose certification leveling geographic in, uh, geographical indicators uh, kind of tools to better equip and empower the local community there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, another a, a intervention that we felt is going to be very, very relevant in the coming years is to be able to create resilient housing 
uh, one one by uh, by creating new ones, another by repairing and augmenting houses with disaster resilient techniques and tools and materials. Because you know these uh, th uh, this area happens to also fall on the uh, the uh, most vulnerable earthquake uh, uh, zone, uh, the seismic zone five, which happens to be the most uh, vulnerable area uh, in in that part of uh, Indian Himalaya. So it is very much in requirement to have a training capacity development for local communities and also masons who can create this kind of structures and infrastructures and also uh, um, uh, empower the local communities through through micro, micro loan program or you know revolving money uh, uh, model through self-help groups which is normally run by uh, women uh, local women com uh, community members in these uh, areas uh, the third thing that we want to focus on is the rooftop rainwater harvesting because you know as the things are uh, there's a uh, they've started uh, ex experiencing gradual and occasional and gradual sometimes gradual uh, 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 water crisis so obviously rainwater harvesting happens to be one of the most potential area that uh, or, or tool they can probably tap so we want to also focus on rooftop rainwater harvesting both again through uh, training capacity development and and mason training and th uh, the last but not least is the community based disaster risk management program to uh, because you know it's very much uh, in requirement to have uh, 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 both proactive and reactive mechanism to deal with any disaster in the future no, uh, and disaster also uh, uh, like the one that we are currently facing the covid-19 because to be able to uh, 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 better prepare ourselves we need a, a recovery plan and a more resilient plan to sail through these situations should it come again or should we ever uh, uh, ever we need to face uh, challenges like covid-19 in the coming future so with this, I would like to again thank our team members and uh, close my presentation. But I, before I do close, I would uh, request my team members, especially uh, Dr. Shalini and uh, uh, Piyush, if they want to add anything to do with disaster risk reduction or uh, nature-based solutions. Thank you. Nothing to add, Pranab, from my side. I think you covered everything. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, you have uh, very nicely covered everything that we all have shared. Uh, so nothing more to add, but in case there are questions that require our insight, happy to give our inputs. Thank you so much once again for a great job. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear clearly if you have finished it because the volume was very low. Yeah, we are done, Manilo. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. Thank, no, yeah. thank you. Thank you to you and all group number two. So uh, now it's time for some questions or comments from the, the rest of the participants. So please. <clears throat> Any question or comments? Hi, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, thank you, thank you for a very wonderful presentation. Um, I'm I'm amazed by the fact that you've really you know covered the length and breadth of you know of what can be done or should be done in the context of COVID nineteen for a particular village. Um, but according to you, based on, you know, a lot of um, recommendations that is being put forward, whether in terms of building resilience to nature based solutions, right? There are a lot uh, n number of uh, solutions being proposed. Um, according to you, um, if you were to prioritize, you know, which should come first or, or how this could be if we were to implement, right? There's a lot of uh, recommendations. So how do we, how do we take this forward in a, in a way that it can be done in a more systematic way. Thank you. Uh, 
Piyush or Dr. Shalini, if you want to take this. I, I, this is a very complicated question. I mean, to prioritize one particular area. Uh, everything appears to be so important and pertinent. Thank you for this question. I think that's a very relevant uh, question. Uh, and of course, as uh, Pranav has mentioned, this is one complicated also. Uh, when you actually want to prioritize what should be going first and what should be following up, uh, I think we all uh, came up with the suggestions that were more related to our uh, areas of expertise. Uh, but I think what is more available in this point of time that should be priority is first of all the food security because uh, COVID might have also restricted the access towards uh, food. Uh, we all know that, uh, especially in uh, Western Himalayas, uh, locals are not capable to produce as much food that is required for their own consumption. So I think uh, working on food security can be a primary uh, opportunity and priority. Uh, while uh, later on moving to uh, uh, biomass or something that we can call uh, restoration that can help most customized models that can fulfill their uh, fodder or uh, fuel board and other NTFP demands because we know that these mountain communities are more biomass dependent economies uh, where their agriculture or their uh, subsistence requirements are more uh, forest dependent. So in some way to uh, uh, make them uh, more independent in this uh, in this time duration can be a good opportunity. And this is uh, uh, primarily good because uh, this is also the time when there are a lot of uh, people who have migrated back to these uh, areas to so food and the biomass based economy is something that can be really helped by uh, developing ecosystem based approaches. And as we also mentioned about uh, one of the biggest payment of ecosystem services that government of India is running in different parts of the country through uh, one of the national rural employment guarantee scheme. So that can be a very good approach to give opportunity and livelihood uh, option to local communities while they develop their village and make it more resilient to uh, changing climate, uh, increasing deforestation, and also, of course, the COVID scenario. And I think uh, later on, the other uh, areas that um, uh, Piyush has also mentioned can, uh, uh, can be briefed by him uh, that can also be very uh, important aspects of developing resilience not only from uh, climate change, but also of uh, diverse pandemic concerns that are looming over large over the mountain communities. So just to add very briefly, um, what I think is that currently a lot of people have a sort of lean period where there isn't enough work or people are uh, not able to use their time effectively. And this could be a good time to actually conduct training or training programs in things like uh, disaster resilient masonry and construction, uh, two benefits that I see. One is, of course, that it would it would also improve their livelihood opportunities in the future, whether they decide to work in the region or migrate into uh, areas where they were earlier. And secondly, is that it would also improve the resilience of their own uh, homes and public buildings. And these uh, trainings can be very customized uh, and need not be very long. Uh, preferences actually for short trainings on specific subjects. And accordingly, we can uh, build um, a sense of fulfillment amongst the community because they're not just whiling away their time, but they're actually uh, learning something that will be useful for them, like you advice. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we we will have time for one more short question or comment. Otherwise, we will move for group number three. So it's your last chance to, to have information from group number number two. <laughs> okay, it seems seem every, everything is, is clear. Thank you very much, group number two. And I would like to ask who would be the the, the, the share who will you share the screen on behalf of group number three? I ask it on, on the chat, but <laughs> nobody answered it. So I'm quite curious. So please. Yeah. I will share my screen. Thank you. 
I, I, I heard the voice, but I, I, I did not see who, who, who was speaking. Could you please write your, your name? Okay. Fernando. So I'm looking for you in the, there we go. Oh, okay. So I'm giving the privileges to Fernando and okay, the, the presentation is appearing. So I would like to welcome group number three. The Andan region as, 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 as you noticed uh, in this online version, the, the group were geographically oriented just to allow you to to speak in a, in, in a time that would be easy to, to, to arrange for all the group members. So, bienvenido, and please, the floor is for group number three. Hello to everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Fernando Cisterna, and uh, we are going to uh, be talking about how to deal with post-COVID-19 in mountain local development in the Andean region. Uh, the group is um, conformed by uh, Claudia Grau, Saldo González, Agustin uh, Tessen, Juan Pablo Pineda, and Diego Horta. We are from uh, Peru, and, and well, Diego is from Venezuela. So it's, it's a very uh, diverse group. Um, the way we have structured our uh, presentation, first, uh, we would like to talk about the international framework briefly also give a, a brief overview about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the impacts it, it has had in the Andean region. And then we would like to share some uh, case studies based on our current work. Uh, first about sensitive agriculture for nutrition, then how a climate change is, is affecting crops and uh, a little bit of an explanation about agroclimatic risk mapping. And lastly, uh, we'll talk about early warning systems um, because it could be an, an extra stressor, the, 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 the problems related to natural disasters that could affect uh, local communities in mountain, in mountain areas, and then some, uh, some final ideas. Um, during the, the course, uh, we have uh, all already talked about this, but we would like to, um, to point out that, yeah, international processes often uh, act as catalysts to generate positive change at a national and local level and to foster cooperation between uh, countries within a region in order to tackle common, uh, common problems. We had to mention, of course, the Mountain Partnership, which uh, acts as an, uh, uh, as an umbrella alliance and whose main goal is to improve the lives of mountain people and protect mountain environments around the world. Um, all seven Andean countries are part of the Mountain Partnership, and um, it also, uh, when we're talking about mountains and sustainable development, we see that mountains are uh, ever uh, relevant and present. Uh, thanks to the advocacy uh, efforts of Mountain Partnership members, three uh, mountain-related targets were included in the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And well, probably the uh, SDG that's more related to, to mountains is, is, is uh, SDG 15, Life on Land. Uh, and why we mention this? Because uh, our own regional uh, platform of cooperation uh, was born within the, the annual meetings of the Mountain Partnership, the Andean Mountain Initiative. It currently has uh, seven members, uh, Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. And it asks us a cooperation platform to uh, address uh, sustainable development of the Andean region. Um, well, we have a, a brief structure. Uh, we have a council of member countries, which is uh, basically a decision making body, uh, regional coordination, uh, pro tempore uh, regional coordination uh, for the years 2021-2022. Peru has the regional coordination. We also have a technical secretariat, which uh, it's held by Condesan, and uh, some other groups can be um, created to address or to deliver specific products. Uh, also in 2007, which was a very early stage of the Andean Mountain Initiative, 
uh, six Andean countries developed the uh, Tucumán Action Plan and that had five work streams. And one of those work streams uh, was related to sustainable livelihoods in mountain areas. And it tried to strengthen conservation and management of agrobiodiversity and Andean production systems based on traditional knowledge and practices, and also to strengthen uh, sustainable rural, rural tourism networks in the Andes. Uh, some of our current work, uh, I would like to mention two, two main initiatives. A uh, preconcept note for the adaptation fund that we are currently working with all uh, seven uh, countries. We are now in a process where countries are identifying which priorities would they like to uh, incorporate in this project, but most of them are related to adaptation measures, water security, um, risk management, early warning systems, and the conservation and restoration of uh, mountain ecosystems. And also in this stage, uh, the Andean Mountain Initiative is conforming three working groups related to uh, first to address the, the governance issue, what will be the, mo the governance model for the initiative. Also, we're working on a five year work plan. Uh, and finally, uh, we are exploring uh, financial mechanisms to support the initiative. Um, we would like to, um, the way that we see that this could impact on, on the post-COVID recovery is to include uh, some actions related to promotion of Andean crops and other mountain products, or the promotion of community-based tourism actions in the work plan of the initiative. So now I would like to uh, welcome Diego to uh, proceed with the presentation. Uh, I don't know if probably. Morning, um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. As it was mentioned in the lecture, uh, the general. Uh, biodiversity, of course, uh, that also face different vulnerabilities and challenges. As we can see, I think you yeah, was having you, some trouble. Cannot, you cannot hear you properly. I suggest you to, to turn off your, your camera. <laughs> I think Dio is having some trouble with, with his internet connection, so I can take over and please Diego, when you come back, you can let me know. So as it was mentioned in, in the lectures, the Andean region and Latin America in general are uh, biodiversity hotspots, uh, hotspots uh, that also faces different vulnerabilities and challenges, as we can see in this image. Uh, these challenges relate to biodiversity loss, land degradation, prioritization of extractive activities, climate change related disasters and different inequalities. To all these problems, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, appears as another stressor. I think Diego is back, so I will share the next slide. Please go ahead. No, it appears he's not back. Um, so we have here some of uh, some numbers for the uh, the impact of the COVID nineteen pandemic in the region. Uh, as we see, uh, about uh, forty million uh, total detected cases. And also we have also in the graphic uh, the total uh, case numbers for Peru and Venezuela. Um, 
Now we would like to talk about uh, agriculture and food systems in the region during the pandemic and how it has been uh, developing. So regarding agriculture and food systems, uh, before COVID-19, Latin America was expected to become one of the main food producing region worldwide. Um, the majority of the production goes outside the region, but the sector has shown resilience due to the adaptation of companies uh, and governments. Um, Nonetheless, food systems are under a great pressure, while the production and commercialization of sugar and soy have increased during the pandemic. Perishable goods produced by family farmers have been more affected. Also, workers of the industrial agricultural sector have been more exposed to the virus as they haven't stopped working. So, and they obviously have been economically affected by more by the informality and for lower salaries. And the pandemic and other structural problems uh, led to the replacement of nutrition uh, and more expensive food by cheaper, cheaper food containing saturated fats, sugar, sodium, and calories. So, um, well, and the war situation is faced obviously by vulnerable groups such as children, adolescents. Uh, I think Juan Pablo will talk a little bit more about this in, in his presentation. But, uh, for example, a uh, women's responsibility in the household and in the workforce implies that inequalities, uh, in, uh, shows the inequalities enhanced by the pandemic, you know, especially for young rural women who must deal with paid work, uh, household work and school online activities. So uh, after this, I mean, uh, I think uh, Juan Pablo will present a specific example to, to address the situation. Thank you, Fernando. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to share um, a case of the project that I am working on. Um, it's about nutrition sensitive agriculture, so which is locally located in the Andes of Peru and Ecuador and other countries. But I'm going to focus on Peru case. So this project looks for a uh, to get um, very high nutrition value foods, diverse uh, dietary diversified foods and food fortification. And food fortification as the basis of overcoming malnutrition as the basis of overcoming malnutrition and nutrients deficiency. So next slide, please. So the Situation in Peru is kind of um, there is a big issue about um, malnutrition, basically anemia in children from six to thirty-five months, which is a very high uh, prevalence of anemia. As we see in the in the map, the red ones are the the highest ones with prevalence of anemia. Next, please. So the project was is developed in different regions. So we are working with um, rural provided services, which are the professionals from the agriculture sector. They work for NGOs and other institutions like public institution. They are implementing um, different ways to promote good nutrition based based on uh, agroecological practice, farming with agroecological practices to get better nutrition to the family farms in the rural uh, areas in Peru. Next slide. So in this graph, we can see um, the project is working with agriculture production based on agroecological practices. So we are promoting nutrition, education and communication. Uh, this nutrition and education communication is doing by rural services providers. So also we are promoting local markets and for generate income to farmers. And um, the family farmers are producing uh, like um, diverse products from animal origins and vegetables and the grains and the tubers. So family farms can have a diverse diet 
and um, the I mean, the project is focusing also on gender focus, like uh, we are seeing in these pictures, like we promote good health and good nutrition for all the families. Next slide, please. So the idea or to promote nutrition sensitive agriculture is in three main objectives. The first one is make food more available and accessible. The second one is food diversification and increase sustainable production. And the third one is the making food itself more nutritious and macronutrients. And so I'm going to welcome to my mate, uh, Aldo, who is going to continue. Thank you. Would someone go ahead, please? Yeah, I think Aldo is having also trouble with um, with his internet. So what he um, told us was that he was working on, on these agroclimatic risk maps in agriculture and uh, how a uh, the changing climate was affecting uh, Andean communities and Andean and Andean regions. So uh, he he elaborated some uh, agroclimatic risk maps for some crops like corn, potatoes, and and grassland. Um, I I uh, from this uh, map, the risk is very low in the um, in the central Andes in the uh, regions of Junín. And also in Ayacucho, and this is uh, it's it's quite important because uh, Peru has a, a really high uh, biodiversity uh, uh, rate regarding to crops. So it's very important for for the Peruvian government to um, preserve all the different varieties of corn, or potatoes, and different crops that are uh, that are. Uh, also part of the uh, livelihoods of uh, mountain communities and yeah they, there has been some problems accessing uh, external markets during the the covid-19 pandemic and how to to get out uh, to the world those uh, those products because of the restrictions in in transport and mobilization uh, here with the yeah we see a, a, a higher uh, risk uh, for uh, I think he was mentioning was uh, alfalfa, which is uh, some kind of grass used for for livestock, uh, for livestock uh, the alimentation of livestock. So then uh, we would like to uh, cover our final topic, which are early warning systems. Uh, Austin, are you are you there? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Air warning system. Uh, what is air warning system? The air operation structure for preparation and response, which involve mechanics and procedure for detecting hazard, monitoring, indication, communicating alert and alarms, and evacuating vulnerable populations to safe areas. Community organization process participatory planning, tools, resources, permanent labor, labor, volunteer, work colleague get. Process information and maps decision about previous identification and periodic set three and vulnerability type considering the possible activity and mechanics organization by all residents. Proximo, please. Air warning system must take into account recent student 
prepared of science goodies. And Pigement, geodynamic hazard, and volcanic process, and tsunami, hydrometeorological hazard, e GP, hexil, and volcanic hazard, and the HN tsunami hazard. The hazard map of the sustainability cities program must be kind of identification hazard. In place, the dome face student execute exit can reduce the participation of university and institutional multidisciplinary tenure team. Uh, Proximo, please. Uh, vulnerability scan. Uh, the vulnerability analysis consists of calling cities physical, social, economic, and environmental. Information in the communities which are necessary info for vulnerable analysis contributing a uh, foyon factor. Exposure. Referring of the locating of the population and higher living on the zone of influence of the danger. Fragility. Referring to technical decisions that occur in both public and private physical infrastructure that make the impact a hazard if impossible. Resilience. Referee uh, to the capacity of the population, uh, public and private organization uh, to organize uh, the server and make decision and make of managing disaster risk. Uh, personal text. Um, uh, it is a this imaging show uh, four state that are considered in the air ring warrant system. Thank you. Thank you. So, just to add to what a uh, hosting just said, a uh, the uh, yes, it's true that we have now the pandemic crisis, but also uh, the climate crisis will definitely affect mountain areas. And that's why having these early uh, warning systems, it's it's quite important. We have uh, a history of, uh, at least in Peru, of not so, um, uh, of very important natural disasters in, in mountain communities. So it's very important to involve uh, uh, villagers and people who live in the cities to uh, be alert and to have uh, this kind of, of preparations because uh, we could uh, have many actions to help the development of, uh, rural, er of rural areas, initiatives, uh, programs, but at the end of the day, uh, natural disasters are also a permanent factor that could uh, bring major setbacks uh, in, into that a uh, process uh, of of develop of sustainable development. I don't know if Juan Pablo is is there, but so let me just uh, finish with uh, the conclusion. Go, go ahead, Fernando. Some, of, some general ahead, ideas. Fernando. Um, I mean, uh, the Andean region, uh, we think that it could really benefit from continuing supporting and strengthening the Andean Mountains Initiative in order to uh, address a sustainable development of, of these areas and to uh, preserve these fragile mountain ecosystems, which are key to our are, are key water sources to many cities uh, all from uh, the coast, which is uh, the western part of Peru, and also to the uh, Amazon Basin. Um, the Andean region uh, is certainly a biodiversity hotspot with structural vulnerabilities and challenges that has been uh, worsened by the pandemic in, in different levels at, uh, concerning uh, issues with health, economy, and food. Um, so agriculture and food security are a very important issue to address regarding the accessibility, availability, and affordability of consumers, but also fair prices and labor conditions for producers. 
uh, in this scenario, vulnerable groups are in a difficult position and a post-COVID recuperation should consider how the uh, multi-level factor interact uh, affecting these different stakeholders, uh, mainly the youth and, and women. Also, uh, agroecological practices improve diversity production of food in farms and increase diverse food consumption for rural families. Um, data uh, systematization uh, and its clear uh, diffusion or communication are crucial to understand, monitor and prevent different scenarios from the post-COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, different mechanisms allows us to understand agroclimatic risk, disaster prevention, and other vulnerabilities, seeing the connection between the mountains, other areas in the region, and the different stakeholders involved. Finally, in post-COVID-19 uh, uh, context, the implementation of early warning systems should be considered in high Andean areas or uh, mountain areas since in, in these places in times of rain which is uh, typically from december to april there is a high possibility of the occurrence of floods mudslides uh, and yeah it's like a stone and mud uh, landslides so that's from from our part thank you for your attention okay thank you thank you very much group number three for the, the presentation i'm sorry for the Connection issues past. Okay, I don't want to repeat again. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, I would like to add a comment because the hazard, natural hazard, is one of my topic, and so I would like to add a comment concerning the, the early warning, just to to give a, an advice, because you have to be aware of the speed of, of the of the phenomenon that you are you are monitoring and from which you, you want to have an alert an alarm or a warning because sometimes uh, there are uh, instrumentation uh, of sellers instrument, instrumentations that promises the early warning uh, the, the the capacity of uh, of, of giving a, a immediate result of the monitoring but then uh, when you go in deep on the, the, the functioning principle of the instrumentation, you, you, you notice that it needs uh, maybe minutes or hour to compute some statistical uh, uh, elaboration, some statistical uh, computation to give the result. So this is not a, a real early warning. It's, it's something that you, you add to the, the commercial to, 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 to sell the, the instrument. And on the other end, I saw mudslides and mudslides could be monitored for early warning because it's a not so fast uh, kind of, of online slide, but concerning other other uh, kind of, of, of hazards like a rockfall or similar that are really an input in time. And it's very difficult to, to to monitor them and consequently to have an early warning system. Thank you. Okay, and if there are more interesting comments than mine, please. <laughs> now is the time for questions and comments from the participants. I already break the ice, so and no, no excuses. <laughs> No more question. Are we already tired for the for the ceremony? While we are waiting for a question, I would like uh, just to ask who will share the screen on behalf of Group Four, please. Danilo, I will share the screen. Sorry, who are you? Because it's me. Okay, on... okay thank you. Okay, so I give you, I giving you the privileges, and please, I, I again, I'm asking for questions and comments concerning the presentation of group number three. Okay, so I guess the my. My, my boring comment was enough. And uh, okay, I would like to welcome group number four. 
Okay, the, the, slide, the, the slide is appearing. So we can, again, uh, I invite uh, participants of group number four to open their camera and start their presentation. Oh, okay, welcome, welcome group number four. So I give you the floor and please, You can go ahead. Yes, okay. No, I was looking where to find myself and the camera. There so, you go. <laughs> um, are we audible? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for um, a very good evening uh, or good afternoon uh, to all our friends and colleagues who has been with us for, for two weeks, you know, this very exciting course. On behalf of group four, uh, we are uh, doing a presentation relating to um, very much a topic that is very dear to our hearts, that is on mountain tourism. Uh, so we have in our group four, Anuradha, Kundan, Pranay, Chiranjibi, Smita, Vinay, Manas, Elmir, Ganga, Yakub, and Anu, so 11 of us. Um, before we all go into the topic uh, as such, uh, I would also like to really narrate how we came to this uh, you know, topic and how we finalized, uh, because we also had a very uh, several rounds of uh, group meetings, and uh, we did also exchange few uh, project ideas um, among ourselves and finally we chose this topic the one that is very much based in Uttarakhand state I'm aware group two had also presented from Uttarakhand so it seems to be one of the popular <laughs> topic for the for this evening but anyways um, so uh, the whole idea is that uh, we are dividing these presentations among um, three of us but uh, if one of the colleague uh, Mr. Kundan Bish if he drops out because of the internet issues, Praneji is also there, who's going to uh, come on behalf of uh, Kundan. So we are me, uh, Anuradha, Kundan, and Praneji on behalf of our team doing this presentation. Um, so uh, the title itself suggests we really wanted to capitalize this post-COVID scenario as an opportunity to really you know, set the tone in the sustainable mountain tourism development context. And how are we going to do? It's really much focusing on uh, you know, the niche value and, and, and the, the assets that mountain represents, the culture and, and biodiversity-based tourism, uh, taking Uttarakhand state as a case in point. Uh, we have divided the presentation um, accordingly. So first, a context setting in relation to uh, for us to understand against which background are we really proposing the, I, this case for Uttarakhand state. Uh, primarily, we will try to understand what sustainable mountain tourism means for the mountain communities, uh, but in then against you know what challenges and opportunities are these mountain communities facing in in terms of, of promoting sustainable mountain Excuse tourism. Me. Yes, me, sorry to interrupt you. Could you please uh, sh show the slides in, in presentation mode? Is that okay now? Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, then uh, we then uh, after um, setting the context, then we will go into the case narration followed by the conclusion. Um, so, um, just for us to reflect back on all the course, uh, you know, lessons that we have taken, Mountain does present quite a unique set of challenges as well as opportunities. When we say challenges, we've heard that, you know, the specificity context very much determines the economic, the state of development, and many other factors uh, that is very much a challenging to really come up with a sustainable livelihood, uh, you know, futures uh, in, in our mountains. But um, on the flip side of it, if we look at the very specificity context also provides us a great opportunity because mountain does have, you know, a unique uh, sort of a, um, assets, which we really want if we want to look from, um, from a, a livelihood perspective, particularly the rich cultural and biodiversity that the mountain has 
are the unique selling propositions or you know pull factor for tourists to really uh, visit these sites so when we want to promote the idea of sustainable mountain tourism we we are looking from the perspective of culture and biodiversity based tourism and why it does matter so just you know if you want to uh, overlay you know the context of why mountain tourism and particularly um you know um, uh, um uh, how do you say attract uh, particularly looking from the cultural and biodiversity perspective is that uh, it really helps us to also contribute to sustainable development goals primarily uh, we look uh, at uh, uh, these uh, goals especially goal 1 which is primarily about poverty reduction goal 5 that is gender dimensions 8 creating jobs 11 Within sustainable development goal 11, particularly target 4 and 5, 11.4 uh, and 11.5, uh, because these targets specifically talks about protecting and safeguarding mountain uh, culture and heritage, as well as reducing impacts against natural disasters. So they are very uh, important. 12, sustainable consumption of the resources. 13, actions against climate. And obviously 17 is on the uh, collaborative partnership. Um, so, so this is the context against which mountain tourism becomes very important. Uh, but the other narrative, which is very important to understand, is also existing challenges and the emerging opportunities. I should say, um, challenges we've heard a lot. Mountains are prone to very much uh, disaster-related events, primarily because of its geophysical location. But on top of that, climate change and primarily the incidence of you know uh, extremes are something that is becoming quite a bigger issue uh, for the mountain communities and for sustainable livelihoods, including tourism. And something which is new, um, which has been experienced, is post uh, uh, sorry uh, COVID pandemic, um, and it is quite interesting to see that. Uh, COVID as such has a different, it, it does present a very unique set of challenges, which we are going to talk later, uh, primarily in, you know, becoming, uh, you know, these destinations, mountains becoming quite a site for overcrowding because of the, you know, people now really moving to mountains for recreational activities. Uh, but what we wanted to highlight, this, uh, you know, that or why we wanted to focus on culture and, and biodiversity base is that we want to take the challenges as an opportunities, primarily in context of really trying to promote, revive and strengthen the nature and community and culture based tourism to build back better tourism. Now, I will invite Anuradha to take us forward from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Anu. Uh, I hope I am audible to all. So, uh... Before we go towards the project, we would like to uh, take you, your attention towards the disaster which has happened uh, in, in the state of Uttarakhand. This is a picture from uh, 2013 and you can see the devastating uh, floods in the Uttarakhand. Uttarakhand have uh, a, a quite a good history of these floods like and landslides also. If you take, take studies from past 20 years, so there are about 50 plus good uh, like big landslides in which uh, complete uh, villages have been washed off. And uh, Anu, please, uh, next slide, in which we can see like uh, a road which is completely broken and we see people uh, people standing on all these are tourists because Uttarakhand is a state which is very famous for uh, religious tourism. And now as this particular project, it, it, it talks on uh, sustainable rural tourism. So these all the things we need to keep in mind whenever we are, we are you know, working on such kind of projects. So uh, I'll be briefing on DRR in my next slide that why we think that uh, why it is important to incorporate these activities in this project. So uh, UNDRR says that uh, if we spend $1 on the DR on disaster risk reduction, so we can actually save uh, a cost of $7 on response. So it, it, if we incorporate these activities in our project, which we are uh, going to show you in next slides, it is, uh, we can see that how we can incorporate, like we, uh, uh, when we talk about disaster risk assessment, we have a, a the Uttarakhand state with uh, more prone to uh, earthquakes, floods, and uh, landslides. So uh, uh, when we see this risk equation, then R is equal to hazard. Hazards are there, and this uh, when we talk about COVID, so it is actually a, 
addition to the hazards, we have earthquake, flood, and uh, landslides are there. And now we have COVID also. This is actually an addition. And when we are talking about vulnerabilities, these, vul these can be different kind of vulnerabilities. These can be physical. These vulnerabilities can be socioeconomic. So if we try to reduce these vulnerabilities and we try we build our capacities, then only we can, uh, and, and, and exposure is also there. So these things multiply, hazard multiplied by vulnerabilities. Hazard is there and we have vulnerabilities also and we are exposed also. For example, uh, uh, there are villages which, which are completely washed off during floods. So we need to build our capacities in the in particular this scenario of this uh, tourism where we are going to sit our projects. So multi hazard scenario based planning is very important. For example, we are uh, we are setting up uh, uh, any structure near the uh, streams which are dry, but we need to think that in, in any case, if there is flash flood, these uh, structures can be washed off. This is one thing and we need to think about different scenarios. In context of uh, tourists also, when they are coming to us, do we have a planning, for example, if, if, uh, if this pandemic is already there and if something else happened, if flood is there and if uh, many of the people are stranded at one place, do we have a planning that how we are going to accommodate these tourists? Do we have a planning that, uh, do we have a rationing for that? Do we have planning for next one week? Do we have all the resources? We need to keep in mind these things. Then we need to prepare for extreme weather events. As we showed a picture of 2013, it was in the month of June and uh, we saw this uh, heavy rainfall, which actually we do not see in the month of June. And recently in, in the month of February, we saw this uh, rock fall and then avalanche and which which flooded the complete uh, Rishi Ganga River in this in this state. And some villages were uh, people were evacuated from there and hydropower project was completely destroyed and there were many labor who, who were who died there. So these events can be there. So when we are talking about this rural tourism, we need to incorporate in our minds that there can be uh, extreme weather events also. For example, tourists are coming in the month of uh, uh, winters and they're coming there to see the snow, but there is no snow, there are dry spells are there. So do we have some other attractions for them? Do Are we thinking about these things? Uh, what we are planning to make these uh, things sustainable? Then uh, we can we we cannot uh, stop any hazard, but we can mitigate some of the risks. For example, we talk about property insurance, the resources which we are investing. We can go for uh, asset insurance also, so so that we do not uh, lose our resources. And then we can develop alternate sites also for activities. For example, if there are if any site is just washed off in in your activities in uh, during uh, uh, floods or during heavy heavy rain or any extreme weather event, so we should have a backup plan always there. Do we have some activities, some indoor activities or some cultural activities that we'll be talking about cultural heritage also. So all these backup plans and all these activities we need to incorporate in our project so that we can make this uh, uh, this project more sustainable sustainable in, in, in context to disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. So now I would like to call our colleague Kundanji to take forward and uh, to uh, explain about the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anuradha. Uh, actually, my work is uh, low, though, thereby I, uh, I will uh, not start my video. It is okay with uh, you, not Danilo? I'm audible. Anuradha? Hello? Yes, you are. Good morning. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I'm not opening my screen because the connectivity is too low. Okay. So uh, thank you, Anuradha. Yes, there are many days in the mountain and forest peoples. And uh, the COVID is another add on. Uh, uh, the mount, uh, on the mountain community. In many, its health system, its economy, and blah blah. And in between, cases are going down, and there is some kind of normalcy returns. It brings another kind of, especially in the hills stations and places for tourist, which are of tourist interest. We are observing higher influx of tourists in these places during the uh, short period of, period of time. To manage this uh, crowd, the local administrations are sending back 
uh, these tourists to their homes or diverting the tourists to the other places. Next, please. Anu, next. Thank you. Uh, each challenge bring some uh, sort of opportunity also. People, especially in North India, are stepping out to their home and want some well-deserved relief for being in Mont mountain area. So the people, Popular places like Madhuri, Dal are already occupied. There is a space for other places and opportunity for other type of options. To tourism options, such as culture, heritage, and biodiversity based tourism. It can be nature based tourism, rural based tourism, or heritage based tourism. Uh, uh, Tourism, uh, some type of uh, type of place, and uh, your voice is breaking. Yes, your voice is okay. breaking. It's okay. Okay. No. Uh, hello, hello. I know it's okay now. Now it's, it's okay, okay because in okay between now. you are breaking, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. So there is, uh, as you in this uh, slide. Which can stay person of this ultimate aim is to promote transition and revive the community reserve culture, their biodiversity. Next, please. Next, unto next slide. Thank you. If you take the case of mountains, from Indus to Alps, Himalayas mountains, there are some, there are uh, same many ways. Mountains have a unique culture and also have seen sets of problems. But unique features attract people. They have rich and like have, have discoveries containing many religious destinations, having many historical places and monuments, world class hill stations, and are all the lives for nature lovers and birds of wild culture. It also hosts many people who want to uh, design to the national parks. And also have a, a unique opportunity for the people who looks for the adventure, such as rock climbing, white water rafting, high altitude tracking, hiking, and paragliding. Next, please. And it is same for Uttarakhand, which is located in Indian Malian region. Uh, Uttarakhand came in existence on 9th November 2002, and is as a 27th state of Republic of India. It has 13 districts, most of our hill districts, about 80 area is in is mountainous, is hilly, and has 55% forest cover. So Uttarakhand is rich in context of biodiversity, scenic beauty. This is main source of income and have good contributions in its state economy. Uh, if you look Hello, at the contribution uh, GDP, yes. Hello, Kunta, since your Kunta. voice is breaking, can I continue? Yeah. yeah, I think it's good if we give uh, Praneji to talk there. Yeah. Kundanji, I'll give, uh, I'll welcome Prane to do this, right? Because your voice is breaking. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kundan. Okay. Thank you, Anu. Uh, actually, the Uttarakhand state, uh, 
is having more than 86% of mountains and 65% of covers of uh, covers of forest. It's a beautiful state with the with the with the biodiversity, and the GDP is, uh, goes to the service sector 38%. Can we go to the next slides? Okay, to, tourism scenario of Uttarakhand. It's it's like uh, most of the tourism to, tourism activities are uh, it depends on the pilgrim pilgrim activities because the, there are many holy holy places for Hindus and many people goes for pilgrimage, uh, almost sixty two percent and twenty four percent for other destinations and hill is hill for hill stations just like in the, yeah, during this COVID many people are going to the uh, Uttarakhand for uh, for the leisure in the hill stations and nature adventure things over there. Total visitors uh, in 2019, there was a 39.23 million tourist visitors. So to, Uttarakhand is more, Uttarakhand more attracts the tourists, local tourists, as well as the international tourists. Next, please. Okay, look, leverage Uttarakhand's great culture and flora, fauna, their diversity. There, you can find various types of flora and fauna over there and the nature with the greenery and everywhere. And the, that provide a benefit, economic benefit, economic and social benefit to the local village communities with, with the tourism activities and all those uh, things. And the economic benefits that reduce out migration because most of the Uttarakhand uh, people need to migrate uh, to the big cities or overseas uh, due to uh, to find the work and make a economic benefit for themselves but the tourism activities is growing high and the projects which we are targeting with the uh, with all those activities and nature-based tourism and all those things uh, sustainable tourism that will attract more tourists and the people will get more benefit out of that and the impacts over there is a deep <clears throat> Opportunities as bird watching, village, homestays, rural tourism, including local cuisine. So, Uttarakhand is more famous for the cuisines also. And the identification of local products, and the Uttarakhand pro is producing more local crafts and products, which is uh, attracted to the tourists also. Next, please. So villagers can get the income from this uh, biodiversity-based tourism, and this will encourage their culture and heritage and uh, conservations also of the village and the nature and the park and all those things. And empowerment, this will empower the, the local people, community, and the, and, and the local government also with the, with, with, with the building the link between rural and urban communities, the, uh, and this will attract more the 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 way of new way of tourism uh, planning will attract more tourists that will build the build urban and building the relation with the urban and the tourism. <clears throat> and these are the resource map where the community activities goes. For the tourism, where the people are doing the craft things and all those things, and the the park, the pilgrimage sites, and the capacity building program for the the, the project will be doing the capacity build, building program for the uh, local people, local community, indigenous indigenous community. Th those community will be able to uh, do the tourism activities and produce a local product over there. Next, please. So the Gangal Gangli Ghat Heritage Complex, where culture, heritage, and biodiversity tourism lies over there. There is a uh, there is a uh, holy temple with uh, with many bird watching activities and farming activities over there, and homestay also. And there are many other rock uh, caves and other things. And this this is really a beauty. Beautiful place where the the heritage. This is heritage site also over there. Next, please. So 
this now the, the project have prepared a uh, prepared a community to tour to the village to, to to the village where the the map is almost uh, showing how the tourists will enjoy the uh, enjoy the uh, the enjoy the jungle enjoy the pilgrimage and enjoy the local people's activities over there and this will this will gain more attraction for the tourists and this map is it's huge in area where the, the tourists can be accommodated next please the best part of the uh, the mountain tourism in Uttarakhand is that the tourists who, who comes from the urban cities or from international tourists they will they they can they're gonna visit the uh, traditional village life where they can live together with the village people and learn the culture of the village people they can share the culture of the village people and secondly they can they can see they can do the production of the local farming activities where the the beans that's very precious beans that is produced in the Uttarakhand area and the, the Uttarakhand is famous for the Hindu pilgrimage there are many temples and holy temples many people go for the pilgrimage over there. and in the hindu in the in the hindu concept the the, the 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 most of the hindu pilgrimage temples are in the high uphill in the mountain area so the pilgrimage need to go to the mountain area so uttarakhand is all about the mountains and and the micro reservoirs is there for the con conservation practices next please And there is always a best part of the Uttarakhand is the flora and fauna of the forest. There you can find various types of flowers and various types of trees and various types of uh, the herbs trees over there in the in that whole region. That's a <clears throat> and the, that's a forty forty in local area. That's a tigers also you can find in that jungle and that. Uh, flora fauna area that in that park. Next, please. So normally the two days are organized and for, uh, with with starting from the uh, paddy field or the the, the uh, village farming, the sustainable the, the way they are doing organic or sustainable farming over there. The tourists will be watching the uh, farming activities over there. Then the secondly, they can they can go to the remote school area or pilgrimage area where where the tourists will be more attracted with the uh, school 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 or the pilgrimage area where they can do some pilgrimage and all those things. Thirdly, jungle walking and uh, flora fauna photographs also you can have a look over there. Thank you. Uh, so post COVID scenario provide great opportunity to the build back better mountain tourism. So the, now there is a big opportunity to build back better <clears throat> and natural culture and biodiversity based tourism. So nature and culture biodiversity uh, con conservation of these things is always there for this post COVID uh, scenario. So the project will be more focused on the conservation, sustainable livelihood uh, to the local villagers that would that will uh, provide the local villages with more uh, capacity to do the their activities and to to get a source of income from the their doing some uh, sustainable uh, sustainable activities doing some social entrepreneurships and awareness about culture and environmental issue of the of that uh, region the the best part is that, that there will be inter, inter, interpretation between the educate uh, interpretation and education of villages and travelers so the travelers will learn from the villages and villagers will learn from the travelers and they can do the design thinking things to bring new solution for their problem also even the villagers can bring new solution to the problem and bring some design thinking with the travelers and this will reserve the migration to the himalayas Sustainable model of village by providing them job opportunities at their home. So the the villages will be more sustainable with doing some local entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, so that more people will get opportunities over their job over there. And they they will be socially, economically, 
and environmentally sound. Next, please. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, group number four, for the, your presentation. Okay, now it's uh, time for comments and, uh, and questions from the participants to group, uh, group four members. Comments? Or questions, obviously. Okay, I guess everything was clear. And yeah. thank you. Thank you. I thank you again for, for the presentation, group number four. And thank you. Okay. Uh, now I, I I have to two to, uh, announcement for the before the conclusion of the of the ceremony. First of all, um, after the closing remarks from Rosa Laura, don't leave the uh, the virtual room, but instead open your uh, your cameras because we are going to have a, a virtual group picture <laughs> of the. Of the course, and uh, the other the other announcement is that uh, after uh, the closing of the of the course, we will evaluate the um, we will evaluate the quiz. We were uh, and then we will send all people who have uh, reached the, the, the minimum level the uh, the diploma. So don't worry if you don't receive the diploma today because today we won't send anything. To the to the participants. Uh, okay, I saw for for two seconds uh, uh, Mike, Professor Frepat, that was in the middle of a forest. If you are Danilo, okay, okay. it's it's not Can so you fair if, if you show up uh, in, with, so. with the forest <laughs> behind you. But okay, in the mountain, I'm visiting. Uh, and I was really impressed by the quality of the presentation. I know the just organized in the groups, <laughs> and it's really amazing the amount of job that these groups did in a just very short time. So congratulations, very very nice job. It, it looked like a conference. From Every every year for me is a pleasure to learn a lot of the group activities. So congratulations, it's, it's really a pleasure. It's a pleasure to, to listen to your presentation. It's amazing also online. I know that it's more difficult to organize a group work uh, using uh, what's after device. It's maybe or organizing a meeting after dinner or after so It's really changing the way you, you did it. So really congratulations, it was really interesting and of course i would like to thank you all the participants especially also our chairman Danilo Godone <laughs> as a friend and also as very very uh, every every year it is it, proving i don't know at, at the end what happened and you know, every year is getting better <laughs> and on my side i'm also happy because all the stuff works it's not uh, you know obvious sometimes we could have problem but of course we we, we just usually find a way to solve also some problem. So thanks again, and I think that I can give the floor to Rosa Laura. And of course, I, I uh, uh, offer so many thanks to Rosa Laura for uh, her job, for uh, the way he's uh, managing the iPromo course and the FAO Manta Pani. Thanks, Rosa Laura. thanks everyone for this great iPromo 2021 <laughs> edition. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Well, it's my time now to thank you, everyone. But first, I would like to start with a short comments about the presentations. I was really, really and sincerely uh, impressed by the very high level of this presentation. I know that everything is being recorded and everything will be available online. 
but if you want to share with me a, you know, a short one-page note uh, to recap what you have put together, I think this would be very useful. Um, also, you know, I think many of these proposed activities are linked to activities that are really ongoing. So, for instance, with regard to the honey uh, project, we do have a, a, an initiative looking at uh, um, uh, labeling uh, mountain products to ensure that consumers can identify high quality mountain products on market. So, perhaps you may want to take a look at the mountain partnership. Uh, page on mountain products to see how we can work together on this. Uh, regarding tourism, we are also, you know, thinking, uh, working a lot on tourists because the next International Mountain Day, as you know, will be devoted to mountain tourism, or better, to sustainable tourism in mountain. And uh, we are finalizing a publication and very likely we will organize an event jointly with the World Tourism Organization to ensure that um, mountain tourism would really uh, you know, recover better, improving the local uh, population, really ensuring that the benefit from tourists stay in the mountains and don't go completely somewhere else. And also, you know, the other presentations, the risk, etc., are very relevant, not to talk about the Andean initiative, which is something that uh, uh, we promoted many years ago, and we are very happy to see now happening in a, in a concrete and meaningful way. So my last word is just a repetition of what I said at the beginning. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for your time, your commitment. I fully understand that you know, to follow a course in parallel to your daily life, to your daily routine, is not easy. In a way, when you are uh, no, in a in a in a different place, in a, no focus on these in a different setting completely. You can really work uh, in a much more uh, constructive way because it's uh, it's only that to have this course parallel in parallel with your uh, daily life. I'm sure it wasn't easy. So uh, really, uh, my appreciation for your for your work. And um, let's stay in touch. In the coming days, as I said, we will add you to the distribution list of uh, IPROMO. Some of you are already there. I see Danut for sure is already there. And, uh, and a few others are uh, clearly already there. But uh, we will add you all to this mountain parish list. And I really encourage you to stay connected to uh, exploit this network. This network is uh, very rich. There are a lot of very you know, important resources within this network. And this network is for you to facilitate your daily work, to ensure that your work can be even more efficient and more effective. And do not, do not hesitate to get in contact with me in the Mountain Parish Secretariat to follow our activities and to share with us any relevant publication, any relevant information. We can do a lot to connect you to other teams, to other groups, to other scientists, to other policymakers. So really, and use us and use this network. And uh, allow, to me, allow me to conclude. Uh, thank you, of course, our Danilo, the hero of this course, uh, that has really uh, done a, a very, very good job in keeping this course going in spite of all the difficulties, the connection, etc. So really, congratulations to Danilo and to Michele and Silvia, who are working a lot behind the scene, to Tommaso, who is representing the University of Viterbo, another important partner. And uh, we all hope that uh, you know, through this little uh, contribution, we can promote uh, a sound recovery in mountain areas, as we have heard during this course, mountain, the mountain people do need uh, some you know, very focused and very specific support to ensure their full development. So thank you so much to everyone. I think we should now all open our video so we can have a group photo. Um, and uh, Thank you very much again to each and every one of you for your great contribution to this course. Thank you. Okay, thank you, also, Laura. I'm just waiting for all the camera to open. Just an, an unusual way of taking a group picture, but. <laughs> yes.
Okay. Any more? Here, okay. Michele, you have to, to shut down your camera. <laughs> okay, it's ready. Perfect. Just give the time to take another one. Just to be sure. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, good luck for, for, for the future, for your career. Thank you, Zonagua. Thank you, Michele and uh, Tommaso. And uh, see you in the, in the iProm alumni mailing list. <laughs> Thank you so Ciao, much, Daniel. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye